The issue is the reason why they have the one size, the values of the core of the company, the man, the owner, and what he is pushing out to children and teenagers, and the fact that it is so popular. Alexis Sunshine 83, it's always sunny here. Hey Sunshiners, Alexis Sunshine 83 here. Today's video is a little bit different. One that I am actually pretty nervous to film because the last time I talked about this brand, I got pretty 50-50 comments and in that some rude and very fat phobic comments that I had to delete. But a documentary just came out about this brand and I have many thoughts that I wanted to share, which trigger warning for this entire video for ED and body weight discussion. If you have to sit this one out, totally understand because there's kind of no way around it when discussing this brand, which obviously the brand is Brandy Melville. Founded in the 1970s by Sisfan Marson in Italy, they opened their first US store in 2009 in the Westwood area of Los Angeles. Their focus was creating a brand identity synonymous with Southern California, think very beachy and American. They sell pretty simple designs leaning on basic styles and even their website is pretty minimal and has been the same, I wanna say, for like the past 10 years. Their prices range from $18 for a crop top to $42 for jeans. So they aren't super cheap, but they also aren't super expensive. They're kind of right in the middle. Everything is sold in one size, and it actually used to say, one size fits all, but they have updated it to one size fits most and just one size, but I will make mention that on their website, it will say extra small slash small as one size. I am biased on my opinion of Brandy Melville, and I want to share kind of why that is based on my experience with them and also brands similar to them and how that affected me as a child and a teenager. I think it's important to know like context. I had first heard of Brandy Melville from a friend when I was 19. She had visited a mall in a different city. My mall didn't have Brandy Melville and she just kept raving about how amazing Brandy Melville was from it being made in Italy, how amazing quality the jeans were and just how I needed to check them out. I had seen photos of Brandy Melville clothing on Tumblr, but I never knew where those clothes were from. So I was very excited that I finally knew where all these girls were getting their cute clothes from. And upon going onto the website, I was pretty confused about if other sizes were out of stock because it only showed one size. At that time, I was a year into recovering from an eating disorder and still learning to appreciate the new body that I had and also struggling with binge eating. Realizing all the clothing from this brand would either not fit me at all or be very tight on me compared to my friend, I felt really embarrassed, like there was something wrong with me. I was reminded of this feeling again when I visited an actual Brandy Melville store for the first time in a Orange County mall that I had gone to with some friends. And at this point, Brandy Melville was like, the It Girl brand and all of them absolutely loved it and were the target build. So they were just going wild in the store and me again, embarrassed that I couldn't properly partake. I bought the only thing that would fit me, which was the star necklace. So I could too be a brandy girl. This embarrassment feeling about my body not being acceptable and that it wasn't like others was something that I remembered from elementary school when everyone was wearing Hollister and Abercrombie, two brands that also leaned into the Southern California aesthetic and had a preferred customer. Every time I was in the dressing room, I was reminded that I was not the customer that 
they wanted as I would try on the biggest size that they offered and hoped that I would look as good as the employees in the store looked in the clothing, my smaller friends looked in the clothing, the models and the photos of the store wearing the clothing, which I wanted to make note that the horrible feeling I was feeling about my body in the dressing room was exactly what the brand wanted me to feel. The CEO of Abercrombie said in 2006 that he doesn't want larger people shopping in his store. He wants thin and beautiful people. He doesn't want his core customers to see people who aren't as hot as them wearing his clothing. People who wear his clothing should feel like they're one of the cool kids. Anyway, starting from the age of, I think probably seven or eight, I have dealt with body struggles, being an extra large and rave girl and limited to, even being told that I couldn't buy this denim, like super cute denim jumpsuit from Rave Girl because it wouldn't look good on my body and I would need to lose weight at age Nine. I even went to class one day in fifth grade with duct tape wrapped all over my stomach like a corset, not even on top of a tank top, literally duct tape onto my skin because I was embarrassed that my stomach was not flat. I used to absolutely hate photos of myself as a kid and I have deleted or thrown away a lot from like end of elementary school going into sixth grade because I had so much shame and I was told to have shame about the way that my body looked, especially from like other adults and parents. Like, yes, children were also mean. This guy called me a, a sumo wrestler, but overhearing a teacher insulting my child body to somebody else is horrifying. I was also maybe like midsize at that time. So I feel for kids who grew up in a larger body and the horrible things they were probably told. And also in general, what people in larger bodies have to continue to put up with is just heartbreaking. In saying all of this, I just want to share how something that can seem small can have a big impact on someone, especially as a kid or a teenager. Everything that I dealt with when I was a kid, 100% contributed to then me starving myself and having a full-blown eating disorder. And I will have to deal with that for my entire life. I have to always be aware that I don't fall back into habits, especially because when I was at my lowest weight and doing the absolute worst, I was praised for my discipline and how amazing my body looked constantly. Even at one point crying from happiness in a store's dressing room at the mall because I finally fit into an extra small pair of denim shorts, praising myself for finally having the body that seven-year-old me dreamed of and that I was shamed for not having and what was promoted to me constantly, even though I was horribly lethargic on the brink of hospitalization from my doctor because I was starving myself. I did want to quickly make a note that anyone that is an extra small or a smaller size or fits into Brandy Melville clothing doesn't necessarily have an eating disorder. I think that's really important to say because I think that is very harmful. I am personally just talking about myself and my own body and how it was horribly unhealthy for me to be that size. Brands like Brandy Melville or Hollister and Abercrombie specifically in the early 2000s aren't necessarily like full creators of eating disorders. It's a way bigger issue that is ingrained in our society. Those brands are just a product of that. 9% of the US population or 28.8 million Americans will have an eating disorder in their lifetime. According to nationaleatingdisorders.org, 22% of 
children and adolescents worldwide show disordered eating. Brands that focus on a specific body and size, especially to teenagers, can just add so much more to the scrutiny that our bodies are constantly under. And as harmful as Abercrombie was, if Brandy Melville would have been in my mall as a kid, I would have started my eating disorder way sooner than I did. To have an entire store dedicated to one size would have ingrained in me even more so that there was only one size that was considered beautiful. And we have to remember that there are so many videos and blog posts about how to lose weight to be Brandy Melville skinny. And in most of them, it is starving yourself. And again, we are talking about a brand whose main demographic is children to young adults with the main demographic being teenagers. Now, moving into who Brandy Melville is. They really became an it girl brand in the 2010s, like I mentioned, mainly from their use of social media where they would share girls and their products looking very effortless. Most of them ranging from ages of 14 to 19, and even the photographers being around the same age range. The documentary goes more into detail about the unprofessional way the business was run, but the thing I was most puzzled by was how active the owner, Stefan, was in their operations with other store owners and staff and not in a good way. I don't know if it's changed since, but employees were required to wear only Brandy Melville clothing, which isn't that different from working at another clothing store, but with there only being one size, there isn't that much wiggle room with weight fluctuation, which fluctuating in weight is very normal. And a lot of employees said in the documentary that they felt a lot of pressure to stay on top of their weight because they were the face of the company. And a lot of them were dealing with eating disorders while they worked there. Not saying again, every Brandy Melville employee is dealing with an eating disorder. I just think that is important to note. With wearing the clothes, employees were required to take full body shots every shift and send it to Stefan, even being requested to take closer chest to feet pictures. Keep in mind, these girls are teenagers, many of whom are underage, sending these photos to the owner who would allegedly, as stated in the documentary, would keep all the photos for himself and would even allegedly fire girls based on if he didn't think they were attractive enough anymore or skinny enough. Which, that alarm bells, this is being based on if a 40 year old man thinks a 60 year old girl is attractive enough. The brandy girl that the owner wanted was tan, tall, thin, usually blonde, sometimes brunette for diversity, and white. Safan even allegedly closed a successful brandy store in Canada because too many people of color were buying the clothes and he didn't want that. I feel we always knew those were the values of the brand, like their Instagram only showing one very specific girl, but to know their owner was very explicit in those values is horrifying. And the reasoning of him only wanting girls he's attracted to, like, yeah, he even installed a light where he could watch from his office that cashier and would turn on the light when a customer came and he thought they were attractive and it would tell the employee to take a photo of them and send it to him, which as the customer, you felt so just amazing that Brandy Melville thought you were attractive. A company taking photos of a customer and sharing it on social media is not weird, but when you take into the context of 
It's specifically coming from one man. And again, his values, it's weird. There's again, more in the documentary about the owner and what had come out about the racism, sexism, and fat phobia he very much believes in, in shared text messages that again, are quite telling about what the brand's values have been built on. When I first saw the title of the documentary having the cult of fast fashion in it, I thought it was very interesting because when you think of Brandy Melville, it doesn't scream fast fashion like Timu or H&M. And when the trailer first came out, I saw so many comments replying to TikToks about it saying, Brandy isn't fast fashion, they are produced in Italy, or how their quality is luxury and they don't seemingly produce the same amount as again, Zara, so it couldn't be fast fashion. There was even people disregarding the entire documentary as a whole because they should be focusing on brands that are worse like the ones I mentioned. With Brandy Melville having, again, quite simple designs and from what it seems like, not that many items, it has helped them create this sustainable look. And in my opinion, has helped them be able to dodge a lot of the criticism that other fast fashion brands get, especially with a lot of their items being made out of 100% cotton versus for most fast fashion brands, everything being made out of polyester. With sustainability and ethical clothing conversations, it can be a tough gray area in checking off every box. So you really do have to figure out, you know, what works best for you, but, just saying something is 100% cotton doesn't mean that it's necessarily the most sustainable option. This definitely, it, get, it gets very gray. I highly recommend watching my video all about polyester where I broke down different clothing fibers like cotton, organic cotton, polyester, recycled polyester and all that because that conversation, um, there's uh, there's so many gray areas. So I recommend checking that out. Brandy Melville is fast fashion. It may not be ultra fast fashion like Shein and Timu, which is wild that there's even like a additional layer of speed of fast fashion, but it is fast fashion. The facade of quality and unethical practices is hidden behind the made in Italy claims. Because of brands like Shein and Zara, we have been conditioned that any brand that manufactures in China is low quality and workers are being exploited in sweatshops, but there can be the exact same conditions in tags that say made in the US, made in Italy. One example is with Boohoo's UK manufacturing facility that after investigation was found to have inadequate working conditions and reported garment workers being paid as little as three pound 50 an hour. You can also ethically produce in China as well. I wanted to make mention of that because brands like Chunks talks about their factories all the time and how you can responsibly make pieces there. But because fast fashion brands require so much from factories because of the speed of the trend cycle, if one factory can't do it as fast as they want or as cheap as they want, they'll just go to another factory that will, causing the whole system to take shortcuts whenever they can, usually at the expense of the workers. An $18 crop top doesn't seem cheap compared to one being sold for $5 from Forever 21, but to be able to manufacture Manufacture with even a $18 price tag and make a profit, which they want the biggest profit possible, the workers are the ones that end up having to pay. If you've ever sewn anything, you know how much skill it takes, how much time it takes, which is why if you see any small businesses that hand make their items, the price is a lot more because they actually value the time that they put into it and also the quality, whereas fast fashion brands don't care. They don't care about the people making them. They don't care about the quality. All they care about is 
how much they make. Before watching the documentary, I didn't know what the manufacturing process from Brandy Melville was like. They do have a, we avoid grading on Good On You because of their complete lack of transparency. And I had gotten a comment once saying that just because a brand doesn't disclose information about how their clothing is made, it doesn't mean that they aren't ethical. And I'd argue if a company is doing something that's sustainable or ethical, they will shout it out off of the rooftops. Even the smallest sustainable thing a brand does gets plastered everywhere, even if it's not that big of a change. And even brands that aren't ethical still make a pretend sustainability page on their website. In the documentary, it highlighted that the Made in Italy tag is just a gimmick since many of these factories in Prato, which is where many Brandy Melville clothing is made out of, is made by Chinese immigrant workers in sweatshops, even cases of forced slave labor. So it's being produced just as unethical. I was also surprised to see that there's a lot of clothing on their website that does say made in China. Again, that does not automatically always mean horrible working conditions, but if it's coming from a brand like Brandy Melville, it probably is not the best. Apparently there were even videos of creators being flown to China to discuss clothing designs, which blows my mind after the backlash that Shein got for their like factory campaign. But again, Brandy has this perceived better than just because of the way the company has been marketed. Another greenwashing tactic from Brandy is the assumption that they make everything in one size because of sustainability reasons, which again, based on the alleged values of the creator, that is just not true. Again, if they cared about sustainability, they would have an entire sustainability page about it. Also, another defense for their sizing is that they are a specialized store for petites, which people that are smaller do have specific needs and how their clothes fit. I think a lot of the debate tries to minimize those people, but it is a valid reason. However, petite sizing is not based on weight. It is based on height and any petite store I have seen has more than one size because they actually care about their petite customer. Almost every specialized store for petites I've seen will have an entire page on their website talking about how it was so important for them to create clothing for those types of customers. Brandy has no page like that. And in recent months, I've seen TikToks of people complaining that Brandy Melville sizing has actually gotten bigger and is now massive on them, their words, even though it's still one size and it is still a small, which if anything, that demonstrates perfectly how they should just add more sizes. They could literally do extra, extra, extra small to medium, but they can't even do that. There are plus size dedicated stores, mainly out of necessity because brands wouldn't make their sizes, but they aren't just one size, they have different sizes. The other defense for the one size I've seen is that it's for kids and teenagers, which yes, that is their biggest demographic. But as in my case, I was not that size when I was a kid or a teenager, like other sizes in those age ranges exist. And if you go to a children's store, again, there's multiple sizes. And especially now that we have the context of the owner and the reasoning why he wants it to be one size. All of this reminds me of the backlash that Victoria's Secrets and Abercrombie faced from racism and fat phobia, which literally destroyed them and forced them to rebrand, which Abercrombie is having a moment. It has had such a comeback, yet still Brandy Melville persists. And with all the information that came out about the owner, they actually did better 
in sales. They've never acknowledged, they've never put out an apology about anything that has come out and it's kind of worked for them. For the people that were confused why they would make an entire documentary about Brandy Melville versus other fast fashion brands, I think it makes total sense because how many videos and articles have we seen criticizing those other fast fashion brands? Yet, like I said, Brandy Melville has stayed under the radar and even prevailed through scandals. And that's literally wild. If someone does a Shein haul versus someone doing a Brandy Melville haul, you know the first one is gonna get way more criticism based on the way the brands are perceived. I feel people have stopped criticizing Brandy Melville in the past five years, at least from what I've seen. I haven't really seen that much because they realize it's just a lose-lose conversation. The customers don't care and the company for sure does not care. I had gotten a reply on the It Girl ranking video where I mentioned Brandy Melville and it said, instead of complaining about the company, just don't buy from them. There are plenty of stores that don't cater to bigger sizes. But again, there's even more issues than the sizing. Like we should be holding brands accountable for harm that they are doing and changing it. Imagine if nobody like criticized Amazon, like yes, not buying from them, but also pushing for them to have better working condition. I mean, that's like the whole thing with sustainable fashion is like pushing brands to be better instead of being like, oh, okay. Especially when again, they're continuing to do harm even to the employees at their store as discussed in the documentary. I agree that they don't necessarily need to sell plus sizes. That would be great, but obviously they aren't gonna do that. If they just instead at least cater towards the smaller consumer with different sizes, like I had mentioned, because the issue is the reason why they have the one size, the values of the core of the company, the man, the owner, and what he is pushing out to children and teenagers, and the fact that it is so popular. I saw so many comments under TikToks about the documentary that were either just talking about the documentary or being like wearing my Brandy hoodie while watching the Brandy Melville documentary. The comments saying, LOL, going to Brandy after this, or just putting put in an $800 Brandy Melville order and just kind of making jokes about how much they love Brandy Melville. And I get it like he he, but especially in the like documentary, like I would at least like take a, a step back, especially with continuing to help the owner make more and more money. And every company honestly is terrible. That's a whole other conversation. But to then like just make jokes about it, especially for the people that were in the documentary, the employees that suffered eating disorders or were fired because they were told that they were now fat. And so much of the debate back when you criticize Brandy Melville from what I have seen is literally like, LOL, you're just jealous because you're fat and you can't fit in the clothing. If you do really love the brand because the clothes work for you, it fits for you, the, you know, it's something that you do value the, the pieces. You keep them for a long time. You can still criticize the brand. You can buy from a brand and still criticize it and also push for change for that brand. It's a bigger message at the end of the day that people just don't, care. And I don't know what it is about buying from Brandy Melville that is literally like a drug, but I find it hilarious because if anything, Brandy Melville is the best brand to find second hand. Everything is one size. You don't have to scour the internet to try to find that specific piece in your size. Everything will fit you if you are buying from Brandy Melville. On Depop, I don't, it just, oh, that like, that really gets any of the baby tees you can find on Depop. I have four baby tees that are originally from Brandy Melville that I've all bought secondhand. And I even have, you know, internally, like, should I sell those on Poshmark? Should I keep wearing them? Especially after the documentary. And again, every company sucks, <laughs> literally. If you didn't buy any terrible brand from the thrift store, there would be nothing to 
buy because all the brands are unethical, all of them are unsustainable. So the most important thing, if you can, is to buy it secondhand because you are not directly promoting the company and promoting also that if somebody's like, oh, I really like that shirt and you're like, oh, it is originally Brandy Melville, but you can find it secondhand. I mean, I understand arguments of like, oh, you're still promoting the brand. I've gotten comments like that. I personally disagree based on what I am trying to promote is that instead of buying from the brand, you can just buy it secondhand, but we can definitely have a um, difference of opinion. But especially with getting people to stop directly supporting this brand, just buy it secondhand. I really don't think this documentary is gonna make much difference. If anything, I think it's gonna make Brandy Melville sales go up, but I thought it was really interesting to see how they tied in the waste issue in the fashion industry, especially from a brand that you wouldn't have thought of is actually part of the problem. And overall, I recommend giving it a watch if you haven't already. Let me know your thoughts on all of this, the documentary, everything that I mentioned in the comments, kindly please. And if you would like to see my face again, then make sure you subscribe right down below and hit that little bell to be notified every time I make a new video. Also, don't forget to follow me on Instagram, which is alexsunshine83. Thank you all so much for watching and I hope you have a super sunny day. Bye.